Hello, and welcome back to Between the Pages. As you know, I'm trying to have more female guests on the show, and today I'm very happy to have Jessica Boyd, who is a columnist for Comicosity and Stash My Comics, here on the show. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Grace. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And today, you and I are going to review kind of the first wave of Marvel Now. I'm really excited because it's... It's getting me. It's getting me back into Marvel. So. Oh yeah, because you know when we talked about uh, you coming on the show, I suggested this, and you were like, "I'm not a big Marvel reader." Yeah. Uh, so, so what were your first reactions when you heard about Marvel? Now, were you like, "That's just ripping off the new Fifty <laughs> Two? Pretty much. I mean, uh, DC. The DC relaunch got me back into comics after a very, very long hiatus, and so. To me, when I heard of Marvel Now, I thought, okay, it's just them renumbering their comics one more time. Nothing really new, nothing probably any interesting. I might check out one or two things, which was my initial thoughts. Yeah, I mean, how can you not try it, right? I mean, I think that's yeah. how a lot of us feel. So what was your entry point? What did you come in with first? Well, I mean, I've been reading S Spider-Man, which is not part of the Marvel Now, but um, I guess technically my first Marvel Now title um, I can't. I can't remember which one came out first. Was either Red She Hulk or Uncanny Avengers. Interesting. Yeah, I think Uncanny Avengers where I jumped in. So, uh, what are your well, like? Before we dive in, what we're going to do here is we're going to cover like uh, the basic issues. Uh, so, before Jessica and I start going talking about the titles, but one by one, uh, Jessica, what's your overall reaction so far to Marvel now? I'm glad they did it. I'm <laughs> really glad they did it because just the thought, even after you've taken a break. For a while, from any Marvel title, especially any of the X Men titles, it's just, oh, if I go back, I'm going to have to research. Yes. I'm going to go in, I'm going to read something, and just to understand what's going on, I'm going to have to research. And the thought of that is disheartening, and no one wants to do that or mess with that. And so, it, to me, knowing that it was designed to be a jump on point, it. Yes made me think a little bit, okay, well, at least I have a fresh start somewhere. Yeah, and that's what's interesting about it, because uh, Marvel Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, isn't a reboot. It's, as you're saying, a jumping on point. It's, it's made extremely accessible, and to me, I view that they've done that by making it very similar to the movies, which I'm not quite sure how I feel about, but the way I see it is I actually think Marvel Now is less like the New 52 and more like Before Watchmen, because I feel it's a heightened quality, which I'm it's impressed with. It does keep a lot of the same feeling for some of the characters. I mean, obviously, it depends upon the author and the title mm -hmm. because some I feel get really off. Yeah. But um, I, I, and I have, I don't know if we want to talk yet about our opinions about them making it more movie like, but I do think that does serve a purpose as far as broadening you know, an audience base. Oh no, totally. And we'll get into it on each issue. Also, you know, what I, what I would like to say though is that I feel that. Uh, I said about quality, and I feel that I agree with you. Some books are not high quality. Uh, some really miss the mark, but some are quite good. But although I still feel that you know they don't have a breakout Scott Snyder type book yet. Oh, that's clear. Yeah, that's absolutely clear. I mean, Scott Snyder right now has turned himself. Whether he, I, I think he just loves the characters that he's working with. Yeah. That is clear. Scott yeah. Snyder loves the characters he's working with, and it has turned him into the rock star of the DC universe. Right. right? Of all of comics. I mean, I, I think that we haven't seen this kind of level of, I think, you know, celebrity for a writer uh, in a very long time. And it usually doesn't come when they're working, even. I know. And, I mean, I don't even, I'm not a Batman fan. I mean, I like Batman. I understand him and I respect him. I'm a Batgirl fan. You know, even the original books, you know, I have all those collected. But we, to me, it's astounding when you have someone who is so good at what he does that I, you've got me reading a Batman book that just screams <laughs> volumes. And the Joker, oh my goodness. I've never been the biggest Joker fan, but all of a sudden I love him now. Yeah, it's so. fascinating. And, you know, let's talk about that. Let's go into Uncanny Avengers because I think that's where a lot of people entered the books. I mean, it was one of the things that you did. And uh, they have another interesting villain there, Red Skull. So so what do you think of Uncanny Avengers? <laughs> I like, I liked, I liked Notice the tense. I liked Red Skull. Yeah. And I, Candy I, Avengers jumped a shark that just... Tell me, one or two did it jump the shark for you? It jumped it for me on the last page of one, but it really... I, I didn't even me. read number two. Okay. Well, you're lucky. <laughs> yes. I know. Once I read that... When I read that final... When I saw that final panel, at that point, I just kind of stopped, and I know my brows were 
thrown together. And I just remember thinking, huh. Yeah. And, and when, I, when, I, when I sat there and I didn't know if it was a good or a bad thing, I thought, this is not a good sign. And I actually had to go to one of my friends who is a Marvel junkie. One of my coworkers is a Marvel junkie. And I had to sit there and I had to talk with him about it just to figure out how I felt about it. Um, because he's a lot more optimistic than I am. But even after talking to him, I was just kind of like, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think I can move past this. Well, I think it's interesting you say that because I think that as comic book readers, we try not to get into the trap of being that negative comic book reader. Yes. Right? So you're like, well, maybe, maybe I'm just caught off guard. But, exactly. Right? That's my thing that I'm always trying on Twitter and my Tumblr and everything else. I'm always trying to promote the positive side of opinions about comics because it seems like, especially, uh, and my brother's this way too, it's like the older a fan gets, the yes. more you find to dislike. And, and I understand growing up with a certain continuity and falling in love with that, but you know, at some point you have to just kind of move on and just enjoy what's out there or what you used to enjoy, just reread it. No, totally. Yeah, so things point. change. And I think the problem with, uh, there are going to be spoilers a little bit in this uh, episode, everybody, so you've been warned. But, you know, the last page we're talking about is that the Red Skull kidnaps, takes Xavier's body and opens up his head and takes his brain and, and basically, and you find out in issue two, is put it in his own body. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, when I turned that page, I said, you know, I, I don't know what I'm reading anymore. This has become like a Saw movie or a, ho a slasher film. And it just, I know those movies are popular and have their fan base, but it's not why I read the X-Men or, or the Avengers. It, it, I, I, I think it's Rick Remender's fault. I think I really like Remender's work, uh, like when he was on Venom, but I think he's a small character kind of guy. And I don't think he's, a, I also don't think he's a big picture guy. I don't think he's an event writer. All right, so you and I both, we don't advise anyone read Uncanny Avengers. <laughs> yeah, not, <laughs> not unless you're into that. No. Yeah, which is a shame because I like John Cassidy's artwork. But all right, so let's switch over to the title that came out today, Avengers. Oh my gosh, I Thoughts? love this. Oh, interesting. I did not like it. Are you a Hickman fan? I have not seen enough of him or uh, I, to really know. Oh, because that's I, right. You're not a Marvel fan, so you're more. I'm not a Marvel fan. I, I grew up a Marvel that's girl. Right. I grew up a Marvel girl. However, I mean, it is just it has been so long, except for Amazing Spider-Man. It has been so long since I've read Marvel titles that I'm just kind of. I'm just now forming my opinions about that. That's those. interesting. Okay, this is great. All right, so this is good because I've been reading Marvel for a while now, and as a lot of people who watch the show know, I am not a big fan of. I wasn't a big fan of Hickman's uh, Fantastic Four. Uh, I much preferred his FF actually. But anyway, as soon as I opened the Avengers, it would look like a Hickman book because it had the same kind of logo, the same layout, the uh, same design basically. Uh, and, you know, I'm just not a fan of his style. I think it's very impersonal. But I did love Jerome Pena's artwork. Artwork was beautiful. Half positive. What did you like about it? This is... Uh, and, see, and see, you saw the logo and you immediately didn't like it. And I saw the logo and I immediately fell in love with it. Oh, how wonderful. You should go back and get some Fantastic Four trades. Well, maybe I should because... We'll get there, but I'm not really enjoying this new Fantastic Four. <laughs> but, yeah, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good point. So so what did you like about Avengers? Okay, well, I think they made it very open to people who are not familiar with Avengers, mm -hmm. but maybe had seen the movie, by opening it up with that team. Agreed. And, I mean, now, I'm a lot more familiar with the Avengers books than, you know, perhaps uh, some other books, only because only because I, I remember reading Avengers Disassembled. Mm -hmm. and things of that nature. You know, I came, I would come in at jumping on points just to check out those events and then, you know, kind of go on my little merry way. So I was familiar with the fact that the Avengers are this large organization with many heroes, but to choose the movie team, I think makes it a lot more inviting to people who perhaps are not used to who the Avengers are or what the organization is. And to me, the the reveal of the additions to the logo at the end, I I just found that a little bit fun. And I was sitting there matching up the logos with yeah, the huge. I do and, have to say that I was looking at that first, you know, that first logo with the blank spaces. Like, I wonder who's going to go where, and is are these these people's teams? You know, yeah. like that did pique my interest. And as you're saying, it sets it up for spinning off characters and bringing them to the movies. You have your core Avengers. And then you have like these satellite ones that they can do with what they want in the comics and the movies. So I agree. I think that it's very well set up uh, from that kind of point of view. I guess I just don't like gods as villains. Yeah, 
That part, that part, I, I did wonder. I'm like, okay, do I need to go back and read some other Avengers just? Oh to no, get, they're new. I think because I, <laughs> I knew some things had happened, and 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 with, and I knew there was had been a writer switch before this issue started, and I looked up, I looked some of that up, but I was just, I was very unfamiliar with the villains themselves, and I was just kind of like, all right, where exactly is this part going? Um, but I loved, I loved that final panel with the people that they contacted. I love seeing Captain Marvel because I'm a huge Carol Danvers fan. Yes, but. she's great. I'm not going to stop reading Avengers. Not only because I love the art so much, but, you know, that's their title book. Something big is going to happen there. Yeah. Uh, and so, so, so let's move on. We'll, we'll, because I've been talking about X-Men so much on the show, we'll do that last. So let's okay. move on to Thor. I love Thor. Thor is one of my new favorite books. It was gorgeous. Yeah. It was wonderful to read. I felt like, even though it was a comic book, I felt like I was in the middle of a movie. Agreed. Uh, or, or even in a in a very well done video game or MMO type. Or of a cable style. television show. You know, exactly. What's kind of Game of Thrones like? Because it was episodic. It seems very episodic, but in a good it way. Does seem, it does seem that way, and it was just it was just one of those things where you know it took me back to you know reading Beowulf in high school yes. and things of that nature, and it, that's the feeling it gave me. And I loved having that feeling, and I loved having the different time periods. Me too. And having Thor at these different points, and you know, getting little pieces of the mystery throughout all of that. And so. this is a place where gods worked for me. You know, I didn't like it over in Avengers because I feel like when you fight an omnipotent villain, like they're really you can't really those fights aren't interesting. But here, when yeah. you have who who can fight Thor but a god? So I've read both one and two, and I think two held up. I have not read two yet. Mm -hmm. I've only I've only read one, but it but it makes me want to read the next one. Yeah, and also I saw I thought uh, Isad Ribic like scaled his artwork down a little bit. Sometimes it's a little steroid rific, but this stuff was just beautiful. Yeah, well, see, I, I felt like he was a little overbuilt on. Yeah. The cover. <laughs> but yeah. but then but then seeing it in the book, I I do think that it worked. Also, one of the things I like about the title is how it shows gods interacting with their people. And how, mm -hmm. you know, you can trade gods and how gods of one people interact with gods of another people. And I think yeah. it's very well done. It's just a really smart book. And I, I think it's one of Jason Aaron's best stuff. I think sometimes he's hit or miss, like Wolverine and the X-Men. But you, this is a great book. So let's move on. Um, I didn't like the first two books, but I like these second two. I like Thor, and I also like Indestructible Hulk. I liked it, but I don't know if I'm going to keep reading it. Interesting. Yeah, it's, you know, I'm going to keep reading it for now, but I'm not a Hulk reader. Yeah, and that's my thing. I'm not a Hulk reader. Mm -hmm. I find him interesting. I find his character interesting. I find it interesting that they're that she was going to be using him. Yes. Well, I and like that, and I don't like it. I didn't like seeing Maria Hill have such a big. I mean, because I thought that was purely because of the movie. Uh, you know, and like I just read an Avengers comic where Maria Hill and I think Daisy Buchanan's her name were kind of like and they're the exact same character that I think that Bendis created. Uh, so that's just a little frustrating, but. Um, and also, this is a place where I would have liked to have seen more of the Hulk from the movie. It was a lot of Bruce Banner, and those are actually the parts that, I mean, and not necessarily Maria, but, I mean, Bruce basically kind of being a lot more forthright in very much a, this is how it's going to be. This yes. is what all three could do, and this is just how it's going to be. I liked that part. Yeah, well, I like the, di I like the dichotomy of, like, sweet, meek Bruce, and then... Uh, you know, him occasionally having this edge, like he did in the movie, where he tried to scare Black Widow. I thought that was really good. And also, there's a panel, the one panel I liked in The Avengers is when he said, time for talking is over. You know, and you see his green eyes as, yes. as Bruce Banner. That was actually the one time where, I, what, you know, you know what's coming right after that. As soon as you see that and you see how angry he's getting, you know that the fuck is coming out. Yeah. And so, yeah. So that was yeah. a lot of fun. Well, I just lo really loved what Mark Ruffalo did with the character so much that I would like to see even more shades of that. Because that was the first time that I really became more interested in the Hulk story. And so I, I like Bruce ba Banner being forceful in this first issue, but I don't want him to become like kind of like a jerk or Cyclops. You know, that's, that's Cyclops' job. He's doing a he good job. He doesn't need to be a bully at all. Yeah, yeah. He still needs to be a doctor, but at the same time, I think, I think it's just more of a... Um, and the book goes into this, just about the fact that, you know, he's realized, look, it's not about me anymore, and it's not about pursuing my own interests anymore. It's well, about what I can do for the world. Well, I loved that. I, I loved like how he said, look at, look at Tony picture. Stark and look at Reed Richards, and why aren't I contributing at that level? And that was fantastic. That was wonderful. Yeah, really liked it. So, okay, we both, we, I like that book. 
you have some reservations. Are you going to get number two? It's, it's not any reservation so much. It's just in, you know, I kind of talked to you about this before about I read a lot of books. <laughs> yeah, the wallet can only take so many books, right? Exactly. So Hulk might not make the cut. Okay, all right, interesting. Let's move on to Captain America. I thought it was beautiful. Yes, I agreed. <laughs> I had to reread the first few pages. And I don't know if it was just children running around and I was getting distracted, but I had to reread the first few pages several times to understand what happened. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if that was laid out clear enough. Well, I think this is another problem where Rick Remender is not the kind of guy who's going to write your wholesome middle American guy, hero. Yeah. I mean, I just don't think he's a fit. Again, I, I guess in some ways I like seeing comic book go there, but I didn't need to see a drill bit go into Captain America. In, in almost in a gratuitous manner because nothing really came of it. You know, he escaped yeah. right away. Exactly. I mean, the bigger issue, I mean, obviously, I think it's too much of a slow burn. It's a it's, weird mix of like a slow bird, but then too fast sometimes. You know, like like things happen and then therefore they have no weight. And also, I don't know who told Ramita, Ju Ramita Jr. he can draw children. They look like <laughs> Right? It bothers me. It hit girl, too. The child was cute, but definitely did not look like a child. Um, and, and I think that was my whole thing was that, I mean, it's Captain America caught in a fantasy slash sci-fi type of reality. And then it's, is the, is the whole, is it just an arc where he's stuck in here? Is it going to be for a long portion of the series? And that was my whole thing was, I don't know if I'm interested in Captain America in that type of setup. Yeah, I just, I think it's, it seems to be like a case of like, oh, I don't know what to do with this character. I'm going to write my strong points and just stick him in it. Also, seeing future covers where... Yeah, uh, with that kid, right? With, with the child and his hair longer and everything else. And it's just like, okay, so he's going to eventually be out there for an extremely long time. If his hair gets too long, he's, he's going to look like sense. Thor. We're not going to be able to tell them apart. Come <laughs> on, you got to do something with that. Yeah. Well, also, I really did not like them being like, oh, we have a clone of Captain America as a baby. I think, you know, and a lot of heroes being turned into kids. I mean, I think Loki was good, but I don't need I'm child... Clones in general, but... Yeah, I don't need child Steve Rogers. So, I probably would not pick this up again, I have to say. No, I'm not. I just, I know I'm not. I might, I might talk to some of my friends who read Marvel, and, because I know that they're good, because they're, they're just going to read everything anyway. And so <laughs> my whole thing up. is if I can have them tell me what happened, that's good enough for me. Agreed. All yeah. right, so let's finish out these uh, these Avengers uh, Avengers titles. We have Iron Man number one and two came out. Have you, you've read one, right? I read one, yes. What did you think? I liked it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to read number two. It was definitely the week that number two came out. It was flat out an economics thing for me. But all, <laughs> I would have bought it had I the money. Well, that's not all your I, fault because Marvel is releasing these books not on a monthly basis. You have some titles coming out weekly now. Yeah, I wanted to read it. I, I, I'm interested to know what happens. What do you um, think of um, bringing in Pepper Potts back into the main title for him and making her a big part of his life? I like it, but it makes me want to go back and read some of his other books because I know she wasn't... I know she wasn't that big of a deal in some of no, those. No, no. So it, it just kind of makes me wonder, okay, obviously they're going to go the movie route with this. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. You know, it makes people more comfortable. It'll make, help more people read comics. So that part I'm fine with. Uh, it does make me wonder how quickly they're going to go about that. Is it going to be too fast? Is it going to be rushed? Is it... Well, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't think that the writer uh, here for Iron Man, Kieran Gillen, who I usually love, and I like his Tony Stark dialogue, and if you pick up two, he has a very clever fight for Tony Stark, which I think Tony Stark wins in a very Tony Stark kind of way. But I think that his Pepper and Tony relationship was off. And if you pick up, I don't know if you saw this, AVX Consequence, no, A plus X2, where there's like I a... Do. Kitty I have A plus X1. Okay. Two is pretty good. I didn't pick up one, but I picked up two because I had a lot of female characters in it. Uh, okay. But well, and then maybe I do need to go. Look yeah, at. you should get it. Has a rogue and a Black Widow f story, and then a Tony Stark, Kitty Pride story. But Pepper's in there, and I thought that I liked the art and the writing for this for them better in that in that half. And that was just I just liked it better. But I will continue to read Iron Man. I, I have I picked up three today. I have it's at the bottom of my stack. I got to be honest. 
but you know, I'm gonna keep reading it. I also don't like Greg Land's artwork because everybody looks the same. Yeah, okay, the, all the women looked the same. Oh, it's, I, it's I, incredible. I definitely awesome. felt like the woman that Tony was hitting on was basically, oh, it, not completely, but pretty much pepper with blonde hair. Uh, totally. And so it, to me, that part was slightly confusing. And at the same time, it, it was just one of those things where I felt like the majority of the book was spent on their conversation. And I like good conversation in a book, but I don't want that much of my book to... I don't, I don't want that much of my book to be about that. No, I agree. And also, I would say Pepper Potts is not like the babe, which is what I like about her as a character. Uh, she's something different for comics, so I don't, I, I don't like Greg Land drawing her that way. You know, I don't know why Pepper Potts is wearing sunglasses at night. Little character flaws like that. Uh, they just throw me off. All right, so so we have Iron Man, pretty good. Uh, let's see what else. Okay, let's move over into the Fantastic Four titles. They've both come out. As we know, I had a love-hate relationship with them to begin with. Liked FF, didn't like Fantastic Four. How do you feel? I love FF. FF oh. is fun. FF feels like, to me, oh, uh, FF to me almost feels like a very non-linear version of what a Golden Age comic would feel like. I agree. Oh, yeah. And I think I really like Franklin and I like Valeria. And so I'm glad that I, they seem to be staying in that book. I like the school vibe of FF. It does. And maybe it's because I'm around, I'm around children and students all day at work. But to me, uh, especially reading the, the children sitting there and telling him about the school... That that part just I it just made me smile. And I also I think it's an interesting choice to use Scott Lang here, because the rumor is that he's the Ant Man in the upcoming film. I have not heard that rumor yet. So. So, but it was interesting, and also I like that they touched upon the fact that he lost his daughter recently. Yes. So I think that's a good emotional hook for him to be around all these kids. Exactly. I, I think Mike Allred's artwork uh, distracts a little bit from the dramatic elements of the script. But I still thought it was fun. Yeah, it, and I can see how it could keep somebody from getting as emotionally invested into the storyline with him. But at the same time, like I said, it's one of those things where um, it also keep it also keeps it from dragging it down mm -hmm. because subject matter like that can very quickly drag such what. Uh, there's a lot of sad things in this book between yeah. thinking about um, his deceased daughter. And between, uh, you know, Reed Richards revealing what's wrong with him in the Fantastic Four, um, there's a lot of things that could really drag this book down and make it depressing and not fun. But I felt like this book was just fun to read, yeah. despite all the bad news that was coming out of it. All right, let's move over to Fantastic Four. <laughs> let's okay. play a game. Can we say anything positive about this book? <laughs> I do need to say that, okay, so before I was talking about too much conversation in a book, and that's not what I'm looking for, this had the exact opposite problem, where I didn't have enough conversation in some panels, and then the characters just not feeling like themselves. Well, I have a couple problems. I loved Mark Bagley's artwork on Ultimate Spider-Man, but for some reason, I can't stand him on anything else. I, I th yeah, I mean, like, I'm just—it looks horrible. I'm like, I don't get it. I loved this guy. He drew so many issues of Ultimate Spider-Man. I loved it. I enjoyed every single one of them. Uh, but now I'm just like, just like Greg Land. I'm like, every woman looks the same. Uh, everyone looks a little like a child. I guess, like, he has the opposite problem of Romita, where ev all of his characters look like teenagers to me. Apparently, they speak like teenagers too. <laughs> or, I, don't, I don't, I don't even know what that was, it, because I couldn't. You know, normally when you, you read a book, you can hear voices in your head, or you have certain characterizations and things of that nature that you you know you kind of call back on. And to me, it was just like I was struggling so bad, and I I had to put this book down, and I did not pick it back up again until tonight. Wow! Yeah. And just before we talked, and I thought I've got to, I've got to finish this. So you only read it when forced by commitment. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> and I yeah. will probably unless something massively huge happens, I will probably not read no. it again, or unless, you know, unless something happens in FF that makes me want to read Fantastic Four, I just, I don't see myself reading it again. I'm not a big Matt Fraction fan, I'm real, I was so happy to see him taken off of X-Men, and I feel I probably wouldn't pick up, uh, even though I'm, I, his FF so far is good, it's the same writer, which is interesting. Yes, but yes, I, that's right? the part I found interesting too, was yeah. just that how does somebody who seems to, you know, at, at the very least, he he definitely seems to get children. That much is clear. Yeah. 
Um, but as far as Fantastic Four goes and just the traditional team, it just it, it did not seem very cohesive. Fantastic Four has just never really worked for me, and it's not working for me now. And I would probably only pick up the book if it had a creative team change. Yeah. You know? All right, so let's... Let's wrap things up with the X-Men. I'm a huge X-Men fan. I grew up an X-Men fan. Right? Like I said, I have not read it in a very long time, but I am so happy that I am now. Right? And we yes. were talking about this before we started filming. You are a fellow Cyclops villain lover. Yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I grew up despising every single incarnation of Scott Summers I had ever yeah. read, seen on television, or even in the movies. He was... The whiny Boy Scout to me. He was always the whiny Boy Scout to me, and I just was—I never understood his purpose, no, except to you know be at Xavier's beck and call. And so the moment that he became a villain, but still saw himself as a good guy, it's fascinating. I, I just—I fell in love with him. <laughs> He's just. He, yeah, I I love him, and I, it seems to me that a lot of female readers, particularly, are okay with this change. Uh, yes. I think it's because, I think maybe someone from the, a, a male reader might think that women would look at the old Scott Summers and think, what a stand-up guy, okay? Like, he, of course, he's probably be, they'd probably love him. But I think that he's just such a, as you said, a boring, and he, I think he's always been a self-righteous character. Exactly. Yeah. He always has thought too much of himself, has always looked too much down on others. And I think the fact that he's not a full villain, but a villain who thinks he's a good guy is with where it the genius lies. And yeah. like a, a slight spoiler for issue three that came out this week, uh, I love the fact that he wants to name his uh, school the new Xavier School. When I read that, I was just, <laughs> oh gosh, this afternoon and I read that, I was just like, man, he's got some balls. He's got, yeah, as soon as like Wolverine hears that, he's going to be like, what did you just say? I mean, yeah. it's just so brilliant and it just speaks volumes about both men who they chose to name their schools after. And it's just, it's great. And so, but, um, I've been saying, before I read three, I thought that this was the best run since Morrison. I thought that two was just like a perfect X-Men comic. It's one of those things where it's, there are several storylines going on in the Marvel Universe where if this, the plot points are almost cliche. It's something you think you would read about, you know, back in the 60s or yeah. something of that nature because it, it just seemed, you know, bringing the entire... X-Men team from the past to the future. Are they really going to do that? Yeah, and I thought it was a horrible... And you're just like, okay, it's working. I know. That's how I felt. When I heard this idea, I thought, this is the stupidest thing I ever heard. I was like, Beast, you're a jerk for bringing them back. Like, what's wrong with <laughs> yes. you? You know, I was like, Beast, you're, you're, you're just as self-righteous, but you're no fun. And then when I read issue two... I thought that Bendis that got happened. yeah. I thought Bendis got the dialogue of the little X Men, uh, <laughs> just perfect. Yes. And I and I thought he handled the, the there there. This is a book where they handle the serious moments really well. I, I think that Bendis hasn't written this well since Ultimate Spider Man. But I it, have to say, number three, they kind of lost me a little because I thought <sighs> Bendis fell into his old Bendisy quirks. I think it served a purpose. I think it was almost a, you have to have mechanical issues, I guess is what I call them. Things where you have to take care of some business. You have to show what Cyclops, you know, old Cyclops, you have to show what he's been up to oh, while well. the new X-Men have been coming forward. And you have to know, you have to reveal what his plans are. Yeah, I didn't, have a, I didn't have a problem with the plot. It was the, it was the dialogue. I thought that Emma Frost was so poorly written that it really made me wonder if, if he knew he was writing for Emma Frost. And see, and that's my thing, since I've never been an Emma Frost fan and I'm not as familiar with her, that's not something that I see, picked up on. That's but it's fascinating, yeah. Picked up on, but not something that I picked up on. Well, she didn't, she wasn't very interesting to me, but she wasn't my main priority while reading the book either. See, exactly. I think he made her less special. You read, you're a Batman reader, obviously, so you know yeah. Damian Wayne, right? Well, Damian <laughs> Wayne is really the male version of Emma Frost. Okay. She's supposed to be okay. like that. That makes sense to me. Yes. That, okay. Then now I see your point. Yeah. So I mean, he. She, I mean, to, to Bendis she, just to, wrote her she like. She was was mad, and that was it. And as a huge Emma Frost fan, as everybody else knows who watches this show, that just was like almost an unforgivable offense to me, especially because I was so excited to see her return to the pages of the comic. So, I don't know. I'm not by any means going to drop the book. Especially oh no! After not that at cliffhanger. All. Oh, I'm. I cannot wait to see the 
the uh, it, it may not be a smackdown. They always they always show you these things that make it look like something some big fight's gonna happen. <laughs> And then, you know, oh, they magically escape or something else happens. But I, me, I, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that there is at least one big duke out with the old team and the new team seeing each other. But before we go, let me ask you this. What do you think of this uh, surprise twist that the Phoenix Force has altered or taken away some of their powers? I like it. I feel like there had to have been consequences for these new mutants popping up mm -hmm. and it wasn't and, and you could say that oh well the consequences was everything they had to go through to get up to that point no that's a cop out no i agree it, you need you need a balance and i think it, it it definitely makes the book more interesting and it also keeps the the bad guys or whatever you want if, if you look at them as bad guys i know some marvel readers who apparently do not think of magneto and cyclops apparently as the bad guys which shocked and floored me. The only thing that threw me is that it wasn't consistent. That it juiced magic up. Uh, and also with Magneto, I thought that he shouldn't have been affected. I think it only should have been the Phoenix Five. That part I will agree with. Because, I mean, because there were multiple people who were hit by the Phoenix Everybody Force. Everybody fought the Phoenix fight. Force. So yeah. Who do you, so who do you choose who was and was not affected? I mean, so people who are not mutants were not affected. I can buy that. You know, people who are altered by science and those types of characters, yeah, the, them fine. not being yeah. affected, that's fine. The, but there were other mutants yeah. who were hit Phoenix Force. Now, is it just one of those things where they're slowly going to reveal the fact that they were affected? I mean, in that case, it, I think it needs to happen across multiple titles. It cannot just be this one title. All right. So, any, what's your closing thought on Marvel now? I think... And, and even when they announced it, even if it was a copycat type move on their part, or even if it had been long planned out, I think it was a good idea mm -hmm. because especially with the mo with their movies and everything else and people becoming more interested in comics or comic book characters, they needed it. They have such a rich and diverse history that it's overwhelming to jump onto and you needed it. they needed a clean slate. Well, I think it'll be interesting to see. I think that uh, New 52 is very um, event driven and I think yeah. Marvel now is very talent driven. So, it'll be interesting to see which is the more successful uh, with the exception of Scott Snyder, but it will be interesting to see which is the more successful approach. Yeah.